we are celebrating the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem on that day what we call Palm Sunday. It's a day of celebration and rejoicing. The title of the message is The Splendor of the King. So let's pray and receive from his word. Lord, we do thank you for sending your word in power by your spirit to stir us, to strengthen us, to show us the way to live, and to show us your heart. So God, we receive from you now. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest day on the calendar, but I suggest to you that it is the greatest day in all of human history. All history turns on that hinge point. Everything before looks forward to it. Everything that comes after looks back to it. And the entirety of God's plan for man hinges on what God sent his son to accomplish when he died on the cross as payment for sin and then was raised from the dead to newness of life, becoming the resurrection and the life. The entire plan of God for man hinges on that great event. So the road to the cross, oftentimes we think the triumphant entry is the beginning of that road to the cross, you know. But I suggest to you that the road to the cross began before the foundation of the world. God sent his son to reconcile the world to himself. And the entire plan of God rests on it. And it was his plan before the foundation of the world to win this victory for us through Jesus Christ. So the road to the cross now is going to bring Jesus to Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey on this first week of what we call Passion Week. Comes into Jerusalem, he teaches in the temple, he heals the sick, he also confronts the Jewish leaders. Later that week he will be betrayed by Judas Iscariot, arrested, brought before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Uh, And then, of course, he will be beaten and scourged and crucified. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that day that we're celebrating, the triumphant entry of Christ, they were shouting out a psalm. The crowds with him were shouting a psalm, and it's a particularly important psalm, Psalm 118. Everyone knew this psalm. Everyone knew that the day that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem, that's the day that they're going to bring out that psalm. And they're going to shout it. They're going to sing it. And uh, uh, it's Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. And uh, it it is a glorious day of rejoicing. The long-awaited Messiah. The hope of the world has come. So this is the day that we're celebrating. There's anticipation in the air. There's something big about to happen. They can sense it. But the crowd was looking and longing and hoping for someone who could overthrow Rome. This was what they were longing for. Oh, break the, uh, the neck of the oppressor. Oh, come, Lord. And you know, in many ways, there's, there's, a, there's kind of a sense of that now. Isn't there a longing now when you see the brokenness of this world? You see the, what's happening in the world? Is not there something that rises in the heart? Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And there was that same longing and expectation. And who better than the man who raised Lazarus from the dead? Now, you might know that just days before this event, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and he had been in the grave four days. And this is such an amazing event that the, the, the word of it spread throughout the whole region. So who better to defeat Rome than a man who's a, a man of God with such power that he could call a man out of the tomb? But Jesus didn't come to conquer Rome. He came to defeat something far greater than Rome. He came to conquer death. He came to become the resurrection and the life. He came to become the way for us to be reconciled to God as our Father. He came to pay the penalty for sin so that sin could be paid for in full, that we could be set free and have life for eternity. That's why he came. And let's give him praise for it. Amen. It's a day of rejoicing. Amen. It's a story about God on the move. God is sending his son, and he's on the road to the cross. And the, it's not only the story about God sending his son, it's also a story about the response to God sending his son. Some will receive him as king. Some will harden their hearts and resist. And that's where it gets personal. How do you respond? 
for God has sent his son to you and to me. Now, have you ever stepped back and asked yourself, how does God consider when he sees us? How does he see us? How does he look at us? Does he say, oh, what a wonderful people. How adorable. I have to have these with me in heaven. I must. It's kind of like when my wife sees a puppy. Oh, how adorable. I must have one. <laughs> or when, you know, when people see a baby. Oh, how adorable. I want one of those. I must. They're so wonderful. Is that the way God sees? No, I, I, I think not. I think he looks at the world and he sees brokenness. He sees hurt. He sees sinners. Sinners that are lost. Sinners in trouble. And he, out of compassion, out of love, he sends his son to save that which was lost. Because he loves sinners. And he wants to reconcile sinners to himself. That's one of the themes that we were looking at so deeply last week at Welcome Weekend. God so loved the world that he sent his son to go and seek and save that which was lost, to reconcile sinners. Go bring them home. So the story begins with those who receive him with joy, crowds shouting, crowds celebrating, they have found their king. But the story is also about those who refuse to receive him, refuse to open their hearts. There are many who resisted the Holy Spirit, kicking against the goads, you could say, stiffening their necks, hardening their hearts. Why? Because they wanted to be king of their own lives. Master of their own destiny, captain of their own soul. Here's the thing. People don't have enough power to become king of their own soul or master of their own destiny. When they stand before God on that great day at the end of the age, that great judgment day, they won't be able to say, I don't recognize the authority of this court. No man can say such things. For there is a day fixed in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a day fixed. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So it's about a story of God on the move. The road to the cross. As Jesus comes down the Mount of Olives, riding into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. Crowds are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. But it's a story that brings Jesus in direct confrontation. So therefore, it's not only a story about Jesus, it's a story about the response, about the crowd, and you will find yourself in the crowd somewhere. So let's read the story. We're in Matthew 21. We begin in verse 1. When they had approached Jerusalem, they had then come to Bethphage. Uh, let's try to put this in our mind's eye. If this sanctuary, let's say, is the city of Jerusalem. If you're standing in Jerusalem, you can look to the east. You can see the Mount of Olives. It's very close. It's not all that tall of a, of a mountain. Uh, we would call it a hill, really. It a, a, a rises four to 600 feet or so above the city. And on the other side of it would be Bethphage. They came to the Mount of Olives then. And Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Now go into the village opposite you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. Now, if anyone says something to you. Now, <clears throat> we know from another gospel that someone does. What are you doing with the donkeys? Then you say to them, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now, this took place that what was spoken through the prophet, Zechariah, might be fulfilled. Saying this, quoting from the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle, mounted on a donkey, even on the colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Oh, there's a lot of depth to uh, this, this prophecy. So the disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid on them their garments on which he sat. Most of the multitude then spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them in the road. And others were waving the palm branches and the multitudes going before him. And then those who followed after him. In other words, there's a great crowd surrounding him. He's in the center of the crowd. And they are celebrating. They're shouting out this Psalm 118. Hosanna to the son of David. That is the title of the Messiah. Only 
Use this when he comes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now when he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, this is that prophet Jesus. Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Then, very famous scene unfolds. Jesus entered the temple in the city. And he cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. He cast them out. He braided a whip. Get out. It's a very dramatic scene. And he overturned the seats or the tables, rather, of the money changers and the seats of those that were selling doves. We will look at this. Very powerful. Then he declared to them, you can almost hear him declaring it with a, a tremendous, loud, powerful declaration. It is written, my house shall be called, called a house of prayer. You are making it a den of robbers. Get out. Very powerful. But then, verse 14, and then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But, verse 15 is amazing to me, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, they were indignant. How dare you heal the blind? And then they were indignant at the children who were crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. See, the children are so cute. They're so wonderful. They picked it up. You know, that many of them were in the crowd. They heard the crowd shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And they just wanted to keep saying it. And then they're in the temple and they see him. There's Jesus. Like, there's Jesus. There he is. There he is. Wave. There is Jesus. Hosanna to the son of David. Can you just imagine the smile on his face, you know, as he looked back at the children? God loves children. Well, how wonderful is this? Hi, kids. Hi, children. The priests and the scribes were indignant at this. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. And have you not read? I love this, this uh, response. He's speaking to learned men uh, of the law of Moses. These who study the law all their lives. Yes. And have you not read? That out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. So he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. All right, these are the verses that we want to look at. Powerful, tremendous, great things to apply to our lives. Starting with this, the rejoicing. Right, rejoice that God has made a way. That was the whole purpose of this psalm. God has made a way where there was no way that sinners could be reconciled to God that sinners can call a holy, righteous God their very father. That's amazing. And that is something that God did, and that's something to rejoice in. That's why that Psalm 118 shows the right response to it. Rejoice, God has made a way where there was no way. Sinners can be reconciled to God. That's something to celebrate. That's the best news the world's ever heard. And it tells us in Psalm 118, the right response, verses 23 to 24, this is the Lord's doing. This is Jehovah's doing. It is marvelous. It's marvelous in our eyes. Look at what God has done. This is marvelous. This is amazing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. The day, yeah, the day of salvation. This is the day of salvation. Rejoice in that. God's made a way. Now, interestingly, many have quoted that verse and applied it wrongly. Because what, what has happened over, I don't know, the course of time, uh, someone would get up in the morning, you know, and uh, it'll be a beautiful morning, the sunrise is beautiful, and the sun is out, and they say, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. They're quoting Psalm 118. But I'm sorry. That's not what that psalm is about. It's not about the weather. It's about the day that God has made a way of salvation. That's what you rejoice. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's a beautiful day, give God glory for it. But the day of salvation is what he's talking about in Psalm 118. And the question then is how do you respond? Because... In Psalm 118, it tells us, this is marvelous. Let's rejoice. Let's be glad 
in the fact that God has made a way. That's the right response. Now, when you look at the crowd, because it's not just a story about Jesus sending his son. It's about how the crowd responds to it. When you look at that crowd, you will find yourself in that crowd somewhere. For example, look at that crowd. and You'll see that some are curious. They heard all of these stories. It's amazing. His fame was spreading throughout Israel. He healed the blind. He cast out demons. With power and authority, he confronted the Jewish leaders. I want to meet this man. Many would come from the Sea of Galilee where Jesus had done so many miracles. It was well known that Jesus had raised Lazarus back to life after he had been in the grave four days. He was in the grave to the point that when Jesus said, roll the stone away, they said, uh, sir, he stinketh. And he called, Lazarus, come forth. They were amazed. The word spread throughout the entire region. And people were saying, I want to know. I want to, I want to meet this. I want to, I want to see this man. They were curious, as you could well imagine. Notice in John chapter 12, verse 17 to 18. So the people who were with them when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to testify about him. Yeah, something like that happens. You got you to talk about it. We would say today, yeah, it went viral. People started talking all about it. And for this reason, the people went and met him because they had that heard that he had performed this sign. I got to meet him. They're curious. They haven't given their heart. They haven't believed in him. But they haven't rejected him either. They're really, they're wanting to know more. Now, I tell you this is important because there are many today who are curious. They haven't made a decision. They haven't opened their heart to the Lord. They haven't believed in him. They haven't trusted him for salvation. But nor have they rejected, nor have they closed their heart. They, they're, they're curious. They want to know more. They would like to engage in a conversation about it. And I want to tell you that because there are many people today like this. And, and be bold and be willing because there are many, many who want a respectful they don't want to be preached at. They don't want to be talked down to. They want to, be, they want to engage in a respectful, interesting conversation because they're curious. Be bold. Be willing. Open. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people today want to have a respectful, open conversation because they're curious. The problem is people ought not stay curious in that place of indecision too long. Because you don't know when the end will come. You don't know when your life will end. The person doesn't know. Like, in other words, there's a sense of, there needs to be a sense of urgency to settle this matter. It's okay to be curious. It's okay to ask questions. But at some point, you got to settle the question. You got to settle the matter. Today is the day of salvation. Rejoice that God has made a way. For God has made a way. Then, notice this, some are curious, but some are offended. Others had heard the report of the wonderful things that he did, and they're indignant. Why? I, I noticed this in chapter 21, verses 15 and 16. The Jewish leaders and scribes and priests, they're indignant. Why? Because they're threatened. They're threatened at his power and his influence. It's threatening to think this man could actually be from God. What will we do? Now, this is an unbelievable thing. You would think that the people heal the blindness and the deaf can hear, lame could walk. You would think, they would, oh, this is amazing. We're like, oh, oh no, this is, this is not good. This man has power. This is like, this is authentic power from God. This is, this is not good. For it's threatening to us. Notice John 11, verses 48 and verse 53. Jewish leaders are speaking. If we let him go on like this, well, all men will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away our place in our nation. Our position is threatened by this man. So from that day on, they plotted together to kill him. Now I'll tell you, there are many today. Similarly, as there are many curious today, there are many who are offended today. I'll tell you, there's no shortage of scoffers and mockers. Anybody agree with me? There's no shortage of scoffers and mockers. There was no shortage in Jesus' day, and there's no shortage today. Because they want God only on their terms. I'll tell you, God doesn't do terms. You come to God 
through his son or you don't come at all. God doesn't do terms and he's offensive to people. But then you see this. Some are curious, some are offended, but some, they respond with a willing heart. Many are convinced this is the one whom God had promised to send. And they follow him willingly. They've seen the miracles. The blind could see. The lame could walk. Lazarus was raised. So they respond with their heart. Interesting part of the story is when Jesus says, uh, uh, go and you'll see to the village opposite you, you will see a donkey tied there and a colt. Bring them. If anyone says anything to you, then you say to him, the Lord has need of it. And as, we, as I mentioned, we know, in fact, the owner did say, uh, what are you doing with my donkeys? And then when they said, the Lord has need of it, he said, ah, then take them. Willingly. It's a beautiful part of the story. Willingly. Oh, the Lord has need of the, my donkeys? Oh, take them, please, please. What an honor is that? But I, by the way, side note, I got to tell you a funny story. Whenever I think of this story, uh, it reminds me of a time many years ago when we were doing some little construction thing uh, at, here at the church, and I, I realized I needed a small little thing from Home Depot. And so I thought, well, I'll just jump in the van, church van real quick and run down there. It's not that far and come right back, you know. So I jumped in the van, went to Home Depot, and I thought, I just need one thing. It'll be really fast. I did not even lock the van. And I went in, got the thing, you know, came back. I jumped in the van, put the key in, and I started jiggling it, and it won't even turn. It's like, what's wrong with my key, right? And I'm putting it in there, and it won't even turn. Then I started looking around, and I thought, oh, this isn't the church van. Look at this mess. This is, and I, oh, obviously, there's more than one white van in the world. So I get out of the van, and I, there's mine right there, and I, the man who owns the van is coming out of Home Depot. What are you doing in my van? So I thought, I said to him, uh, the Lord has need of it. <laughs> you know, little humor, break the ice. And I said, oh, it's, uh, it's funny, funny, you know. Your van looks like my van. I'm actually a pastor. Uh-huh. Oh, no, really, really. He got in his van and followed me almost all the way to the church. <laughs> really, I'm a nice guy. Really, I am. Anyway, okay, back to the story. The Lord has need of it. He willingly sent it. What an honor is this? Because you see this thing. The Lord used many things in his ministry, and what an honor. Uh, he used Peter's boat. After he had been done fishing, Jesus requested to put out a bit, and he sat in the boat and taught the crowd. What a privilege to use his boat. Uh, a little boy had five loaves and two fish. Uh, I, I'm convinced that the, that the boy, you know, hearing the conversation between Jesus and the disciples came up, I've got five loaves, take my lunch. What an honor. Uh, you might remember in the upper room when Jesus had that last supper with the disciples, it was a borrowed upper room. You might also know that when Jesus was buried, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Although he didn't need it very long. He only needed the tomb for three days. But what an honor to be used of the Lord. Do you know what? God's still using people today. And it is an honor. It is an honor to be used of the Lord. You know, last week at Welcome Weekend, we gave opportunity for people to be uh, counselors, you know, to pray with people. There's a making decisions for Christ and such. And many people like volunteered for like several services. Oh yeah, we want to pray with people many times. And afterward, I, I spoke to several who said, what amazing thing. Wow, what a privilege was that? We got to pray with people as they're making a decision for Christ or rededicating their lives. What a privilege is that? See, when God has done such for you, and he's done amazing things, this, there's something that rises in your heart that wants to do something for him. Like, what an honor is that? Now, back to our story in Matthew 21. It's a story of Jesus sending his son, but it's also a story of the response. In other words, when God says, sends his son, God expects a response. God sent an invitation with the son. 
And God expects a response. You know, today, when, sen when someone sends uh, an, inv an invitation, it's very common to send with that invitation uh, the letters RSVP. And it, it's actually French. It stands for Respondus s'il vous plaît. It means respond if you please to this invitation. I'm asking you that you would respond to it. Don't ignore the invitation. So you respond. And you would then, RSVP means that you would respond by saying, thank you for the invitation. That is a wonderful honor that you would invite me. I accept. But RSVP also means, thank you for the invitation. I cannot come. I, I, I cannot come. But that's part of the RSVP. It's like, decide, are you going to come or are you not going to come? RSVP means, I'm sending you an invitation. I want to know if you're going to come or not going to come. And when God says his son, he wants to know how you're going to respond to that son. See, the greater the invitation, the more important the response. Notice, for example, let's make a comparison. If somebody gives you an invitation to say a timeshare presentation, well, that's one thing. But when God says and sends his son with an invitation to be uh, uh, reconciled to God and th that God would give you a relationship by which a sinner can call God, the holy, righteous God, his father, well, that's a whole nother thing altogether. And so therefore, we see this. God is sending his son. And then it shows us God stand, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. God is on the move. God is pursuing you. God wants and asks that you would respond to his invitation. Here's what's interesting about this. God made an appointment with Israel exactly 483 years prior to this event. This isn't a very exact thing. Very exact. It tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 9 that from the decree... And this is a very clear uh, place in history. From a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah will be an exact number of years. 483. That's very exact. And it tells us, when you look at the prophetic word of God, that when the Messiah comes, you will recognize him. You will be able to know that it is he by the signs that he does. Because the blind will see. The lame will walk. The deaf will hear. You will know him. You'll recognize him. I'll send him to you. But what we see is he's sending his son to go and seek after sinners. Revelation 3 verse 20, one of the famous places where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, which suggests he's calling out your name. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will Come into him and dine with him and he with me. That's an invitation to relationship. That's what that is. They were told in advance. It's right before their eyes. Jesus performed all the signs that were expected of the Messiah. You'll know. You'll see. You'll recognize him. Now he's walking right into the center of Jerusalem. That demands a response. Interesting uh, part of this story. And another point when John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, when John the Baptist uh, uh, was in prison, he sent some messengers to Jesus saying, are you the one or should we look for another? Go, cool. he sent his message. You go ask him, are you the one? I need the confirmation. I need to know. Are you the one? So this uh, tells us in Luke chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus, hearing this question, the messengers come from John. John is asking, please tell us, are you the one? Jesus, in uh, Luke 7, verse 22, Jesus said to them, you go and you report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. Let the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You go tell John that, and he will know the answer. All the things that the Messiah would do so that you will know him at his coming. Jesus did. Just days before, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies of Scripture. What is the probability that one man could randomly fulfill that many prophecies? 
I mean, it's astronomical. But then we see this. God sends his son. That demands a response. But then we see this. And then God grieves when we don't respond. God grieves when we don't respond. There's this scene that unfolds. Jesus, as he descends from the Mount of Olives, there was Jerusalem spread out before him, began to weep. A deep, deep weep. Oh, the crowds are celebrating, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna. But Jesus, when he sees the city, the, the word in the Greek is very clear. It's a, it's a deep, grieving. Matthew 23, verse 37 to 38. Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. She who kills prophets and stones those sent to her. Oh, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling, you would not have it. So behold, your house is being left to you desolate. He's speaking a word, a prophecy, knowing that the rejecting of God, the rejecting of the long-awaited, well-promised, exactly timed Messiah, would result in the Romans overtaking their city and being left to them desolate. You know, Jewish music, if you know anything about music, you might know that uh, Jewish music is written typically in a minor key. Minor keys are sad, kind of a dark. Uh, major keys are, you know, more rejoicing, bright, you might say. M many of our songs are written in major keys. But their songs are typically written in a minor key. And you could ask, you say, well, why, why do the Jews write their songs typically in minor keys? They would answer, because the Messiah has not yet come. And it, there's a sadness because the long-awaited Messiah has not yet come. And so we long, we wait. While we wait, we mourn. But the day that he comes, that's a day of rejoicing. Then we'll sing our songs, you know, in the major key. What's sad is this. What's sad is that the Messiah did come, but they did not recognize him at his coming. That's why Jesus is weeping as he descends the Mount of Olives. For his plan... God's offer to them is to send his son, the long-awaited one, appointed hour, the appointed time he comes with all of the signs that you would recognize him, but they would not because he wanted to bless them. That is what God wants to do. That, notice Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare. That means to bless you for good. It's not for calamity, but it's to give you a future and a hope. That's, that's the heart of the Lord. God doesn't want you to reject him. God doesn't want you to turn away from the offer of life. In the book of Ezekiel, it says, God says, I take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, but that the wicked will turn from his wicked ways and come and return to the Lord. That's what gives the Lord rejoicing. Jesus said, when one the sinner repents, the angels of heaven rejoice. That's what God's heart is. And when you don't receive, when you don't respond, if you reject the offer, it grieves his heart. And then lastly, and we'll close with this. Please note this part of the story. God may overturn some things. Jesus came on the foal of a donkey, sign of peace. Now, at the end of the age, Scripture describes he will come on a great white horse. That's a, it, it's a picture of authority and power. But now, on this day, he comes in the full. That's a baby donkey. It's a sign of peace, for he's using love rather than power. Notice Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that it is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to have everlasting life. He wants you to love him as a response to how much he loved you. So he stands at the door and knocks. Now imagine this for a moment. He stands at the door and knocks. You know who we're speaking of here? We're, we're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
All authority under heaven has been given to me, he said. Can you imagine this power, this authority, standing at the door and it's closed? A door. You have a door. Oh, how quaint. A door. The King of kings and Lord of lords stands and you have a door. How quaint is that? With all power. Could he not? With all power, just boom, the door flies off his hinges. How dare you put a door? This is the king of kings and lord of lords. You have a door. Be gone. No, that's not what he did. Behold, they stand at the door and knock. That's amazing. You know, in another place, we see the revealing of the heart of God. And it is quite amazing to consider. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In that chapter, he says, God is reconciling the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And then gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore... We are ambassadors for Christ. Continuing on, then he says, It is as though God were entreating through us. Therefore, we beg you in the name of Jesus Christ to be reconciled to God. That's amazing. God is entreating? You know what the word entreat means? It means to ask, yes, but it means to ask deeply. It's a deep ask. You know, there's different levels of asking. Um, could you do me a favor? Yeah, that's a light ask. But entreating is a deep ask. It is as though God were entreating through us Therefore, we beg you in the name of Jesus Christ to be reconciled to God. Don't reject this. God loves you. He sent his son to go and seek and to save that which was lost. Don't reject this. But then you see his power in the story. He is meek, but he is not weak. Meekness is power under control. He is power. He is authority. When they came to arrest him that night, that, that famous night of his betrayal, they came with soldiers from the temple to arrest him. Are you the one whom we seek? When he said, I am, the crowd fell backward at the declaration of it. I am power and authority. Then you look at Matthew 21, and you see... Jesus entering the temple and you see a display of anger. Question, does God, uh, does God ever get angry? Yes. And what causes God to be angry? Anything that stands in the way of the fullness of what God wants to do. These people were standing in the way of those who wanted to come and worship And it went something like this. Let's say there's a fellow up in Galilee. And uh, it's the time of the Passover where Moses had prescribed that people should come and bring a sacrifice at the Passover time. And so someone says from Galilee, it's a long journey. I, I, I will buy something. I'll bring some money with me and I'll buy a dove, you know, when I get to the temple. So he, he makes the long journey all by foot. And he goes to the temple, uh, uh, where can I buy a dove, you know, for the sacrifice? Oh, go to the, the, the dove seller's table. So he goes to the dove seller's table. I'd like to buy a dove for the sacrifice. What is the price? Mm, no, no, that's not the right price. That's, that's, that's exorbitant. That's far too high. It is the price today, my friend. You want to worship? You pay the price. That's not right. This is not right. You want to worship, you pay. Mm. So you reach in your pocket and you bring out, oh, is that Roman coin? No, no, no. You, you don't buy a, a dove with dirty coin. 
You must exchange it for Jewish temple, shekel. Fine, where? Exchange table, you go there. I need to exchange these Roman coins, please, for the shekel. What is the exchange rate? That's not right. That's not the exchange rate. It is now, my friend. You want to worship? You pay. This is not right. You pay. Jesus comes to the scene. Offending Jesus at this. Standing in the way. How dare you? This is, a, this is my father's house. And so it, with authority and power, he takes hold of the ta tables. Now these are not little plastic tables we have. These are like thick wooden tables. He takes hold of the tables and he tosses over the money changers table. Get out. Coins flying everywhere. Get out. So this is a rather dramatic, Pastor. Oh, it's a dramatic scene. And then he takes out the tables of, the, of the, those selling doves, throws over the table. Get out. Doves flying everywhere. Chases them out with a whip. This is my father's house. And this is to be a house of prayer, and you are making it a den of robbers. What makes God angry is anything that stands in the way of the fullness of God in their life. Here's why I want to emphasize this point. God's still overturning things. And if there are things in your life that stand in the way of the fullness of God, God may overturn that. But if he does, it's because he wants the fullness of God, the fullness of God's favor, the fullness of God's blessing in your life. He may overturn that. But that's glorious. Do you not want the fullness of God? God wants that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for such a powerful story that reveals to us again the heart that you have for us, that you send your son at the appointed day with the, with the signs that make it so clear that you would send him with these signs that are so powerfully recognized. The, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached. God, we, we are so thankful that you sent your son And we open our heart, say yes to you. The answer is yes. We want that offer of life. And church, please know this as we're continuing to pray. Would you say to the Lord today, I want the fullness of God in my life. If there's anything standing in the way, God, then overturn it. I want the fullness of God. I want the fullness of blessing. I want the fullness of God's favor. I don't want anything standing in the way of the fullness of God in my life. Church, would you say that to the Lord? Would you, say, would you make a declaration of it by just raising your hand to the Lord? I just want to declare it. I just want to say it. Just raise your hand to the Lord. It's a declaration of your heart to Him. Father, thank you so much for showing us how much you love us. That you want the fullness of God. Well, God, we say to you, we want the fullness of God ourselves. Move in power. We pray that in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor? Amen. Amen.